This week, I, I got to listen to my eight-year-old son and his classmates as they uh, performed a little musical production. And the premise of their production was that they were a group of kids who were traveling around the world to different countries, encountering different cultures, and so they would sing different traditional songs from those countries and those cultures that they visited. It was a very well done production. All of the parents loved it. But the very final song that those kids sang really kind of stuck with me, and I want to share the lyrics that I heard them sing. They said, saying, we are the children walking hand in hand. We are the children, watch us when we stand. For liberty and freedom, peace and brotherhood, we are the children, we stand for good. That's a beautiful sentiment, right? My question for you is, does that describe your world? Are those the things that you see and you encounter in the culture in which you live? You know what? Liberty and freedom, I think we all can get on board with that, right? We're all Americans, so we love talking about those things. But peace? Brotherhood? How does the world react? How do you react? When you come into contact with an individual or maybe a group of people whose skin color is different than yours. Or whose cultural and ethnic traditions and backgrounds and ceremonies are very different from yours. How do you respond? How, how do the, you react? How does the, the world react when the, the deepest held values of another person are are different than yours. And how does the world respond when these different cultures clash? It creates a negative reaction and maybe negative results. What's the human response to that? Is the human response protests, picket lines, handheld signs, shouting into a megaphone, drawing the crowd, commanding them to come together and to chant for change. Facebook and Instagram tirades on racial injustices and prejudice and, and political agendas that are out there. throats with violence on our hands. And we push back. Conflicts by war and conquest so that we can force people, martially gather them together and put them in, into submission under one rule and, and force unity that way. And what is the human response? to disunity, to tension, conflict. Human response and peace. So what's the Bible's response? And how can you and I as believers what the Bible says as Christians, how can we respond? Better 
So if you're taking notes this morning, that's the first thing that you can make. To tension out in the world is the cross. You know, the cultural climate that existed when Paul wrote these words was just as rife with tension as it is today. You notice in the very first things that Paul wrote, he addressed those who are Gentiles by birth. Uh, everyone in that assembly, that congregation, who couldn't trace their bloodlines back to Abraham. Everyone for whom the names of David and Solomon, Moses, Jacob, Joseph, those were not household names that had special honor because they weren't Jewish. They were Greeks or Romans, Spaniards, Cretans, wherever they came from, as they came together in the city of Ephesus, and in that city, skin colors varied, cultural traditions and ceremonies were different, and tension existed. And as often is the case, right, history exacerbates that tension. About 200 years before Paul wrote these words, there was a Greek ruler whose name was Antiochus, and he ruled over the area of Judah and Jerusalem, which was, you know, the area of Jewish heritage, right? Uh, Antiochus, he gave himself the name Theos Epiphanes, uh, which means the God who has appeared. He thought pretty highly of himself. But some others and some other historians, they gave him a different nickname. Instead of Epiphanes, they gave him the nickname Epimanes, Antiochus the Insane. But Antiochus, during his rule, he sought out to eradicate and remove the Jewish religion and culture. He confiscated the temple treasures in order to finance his own military campaigns. He prohibited and outlawed the observance of the Sabbath day. He even went so far as to construct an altar to Zeus right on top of the altar of burnt offerings that was in the temple courtyards in Jerusalem. And then he commanded that every single month an offering would be made to Zeus on that altar. Do you think that that affected how Jewish people felt about Greek people? And, and how did Greek people feel about Jewish people? You notice what Paul writes here, and he says, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised. They were called this derogatory name by those who call themselves the circumcision. By their Jewish brothers and sisters in Christ, Jewish believers, they called them this derogatory name. You see, God had chosen the family of Abraham to be a a special family, a special nation. And that choice was purely out of his grace, but he did choose them to be the keepers of his promise to the world. His promise to save the world. To send a deliverer. And a sign of that promise was this surgical act of circumcision It was a sign that was intended to remind God's people that everything that they did that would distinguish themselves, separate them from the nation surrounding them, was to be so that they could be a witness to the world of God's grace. But at this time, there were some 
some Jewish believers who had taken that outward sign that Paul says is something that is done by human hands, yet he needed to address it because they had taken this outward sign of God's covenant, the way that he had bound himself to save the world. They took this outward sign, and it now was a mark of pride and arrogance for them. It was something that they held over the heads of their Greek brothers and sisters. And so Paul needed to address it. And as he did, he provided a sobering reminder for all of them. As there was this this deep wedge that could be driven between Jews and Greeks, this wedge that could stir up animosity and hatred towards one another that could fester, boil over, he reminded them a very important reminder for all of us, a reminder of where we all once stood. And so he said, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. There was an exclusion that existed. There was separation that was there, but the separation that was there, it was spiritual. They once lived without God. And when you live without a connection to God, you're completely without hope. Every one of us was once separate from Christ. The the disobedience and the rebellion against God's moral commands that marked our lives clearly, unmistakably separated us from Christ. We're apart from the great covenant, this way in which God had bound himself to save his people because we're apart from Christ. We had not received the promise of that covenant until the cross. Until we leaned on the cross of Jesus for our salvation. The cross which is a sign of God's new covenant. This new way in which God has bound himself to us. And so Paul writes about that sign. He says, now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. The gap that existed, it was closed by the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ washed away all the animosity, all the anger, all the division that was present between God and human beings. And because it washed away all that division, all that animosity, all that anger, all that hostility that was between God and us, it also washed away any anger, division, or hostility that could possibly be between us and another person. Paul said that Christ himself had become our peace. He destroyed the dividing wall and barrier. And Jesus was the complete fulfillment of all of God's commands and regulations. All the ones we couldn't live up to, all the ones the Greeks couldn't live up to, all the ones the Jews couldn't live up to. Jesus fulfilled them. He completed them. And through the cross, God has bound himself to us. Through the cross, God declared that we have peace with him, that the barriers have been taken down, that the fences that we would construct are removed. Between the cross, whatever separates us has been destroyed. And in opposition to circumcision, which had been a sign of God's former covenant, something that was done by human hands, this new sign of the new covenant is something that is done by God's own hand. And so at the cross, it was human hands that stripped Jesus of his clothing. It was human hands that cracked the whip, that flogged his back. Human hands that formed the fists that crushed into his jaw. 
human hands that thrust that thorny crown onto his head, human hands that drove the spikes through his wrists and into his feet. It was human hands that hoisted him up on the top of that hill, but it was God's hand that did something magnificent. It was God's hand that worked through all of that and declared that Jesus gave his life in our place, in your place and in mine. It was God's hand that opened wide and and poured out forgiveness, freely offered forgiveness through that act because Jesus freely offered himself, freely poured forth his blood for us. Human hands took Jesus' body down. There were human hands that wrapped his cold corpse with strips of linen. Human hands that took the aloes and the spices to try to hold off the decay that they expected and anticipated. Human hands that carefully laid him in that rocky tomb, but it was God's hand that raised him up from the dead. God, God's hand that performed this miracle of his grace. God's hand that then declared to us that, yes, indeed, we have peace with God. Yes, indeed, Jesus' sacrifice was acceptable. It has washed us clean. That was God's hand. So that we could know fully and completely that we are at peace with God. And as God's hand offered that peace, then our hands can too. Our hands can hold out that peace to others. And if it means that that we need to extend ourselves, we need to to step outside of our comfort zone just a little bit more, wouldn't it be worth it for another person to know this peace? Wouldn't it be worth it for another person to know how God's hand has held out grace and forgiveness to them? Can't all of the division, all the hostility, isn't that washed away by the reality of this sign that we have in the cross, this sign given by God's own hand? And it's God's own hand then that he uses to build us into his house. Paul wrote to those Christians in the city of Ephesus, he said, consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. God builds us all together in Christ. And as he does so, he puts us on the foundation of his word. The prophetic writings of the Old Testament and the apostolic writings of the New, all those writings that came before Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, all the writings that came after Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, they all focused on Christ. They were all connected in Christ. Christ unites all of those together so that we can build on this solid foundation. Without Christ, it crumbles. The unity that we want, it shatters. But in his death and resurrection, we are given a true foundation upon which to build. All of you who traveled to worship this morning, uh, you noticed that our campus looks a little different. A building project has started for sure. And we're going to get this front row seat. We're going to get to sit and watch as ground is cleared, as foundations of concrete are poured, as steel is erected, as, as brick and mortar and stone and lumber all comes together and, and it, it's joined together and, and many hands, many workers using many tools and many machines are going to be working on that building over the next 14, 15 months, whatever. We're going to see it rise up. All these different parts. But one building. One building is going to serve our ministry so well. And imagine that construction project. And then think about the construction project that God carries out in Christ. Paul says, In him, the whole building is joined together. 
and it rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. Paul writes, in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. God's going to do that by his own hands. And we get a front row seat. We get a front row seat to see how God is going to work in our hearts and in our lives with his word, with his sacraments. How he's going to work in the hearts and the lives of our brothers and sisters in Christ through that very same word, through those very same sacraments. And he's going to build us all together a united house. And we're all different. The very pieces that we are, but Christ draws us all together in unity. And so to all the hostility of the world, all the animosity that's out there, all the division, the church can answer the cross. You and I can answer the cross of Jesus. Because that cross delivers humility, as we all understand that we all rely fully on the grace of Christ. We all rely fully on his forgiveness. That cross delivers a new viewpoint because every single person that I see, every single human being is a soul for whom Jesus went to that cross. And so, dear friends, we have a reason to sing. We have a reason to sing out loud. We can sing, we are the children, because we know we have become children of God through Christ's blood. We can sing that we are walking hand in hand together, and even though our hands might all be different colors, we know that that God has brought us together in Jesus. We can sing of liberty and freedom Because we know that the liberty and the freedom we have, it's freedom from the guilt of our sin. It's freedom from death. We can sing of peace and brotherhood, the truest kind of peace. The peace that comes because we know the peace that we have with God. And this covenant that he has made, the way he has bound himself to us in Christ and has delivered that peace through the cross. Amen? Amen.